Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. This is the episodes that I do. Today, we have on Uri Gordon, who uh, has been around quite some time doing anarchist work, uh, not only with Anarchists Against the Wall, but also with uh, the Anarchist Studies Network. Uri Gordon is the publisher of Anarchy, the writer of Anarchy Alive, and has uh, work that has been translated into 13 different languages. Um, there's so much that Erie has done. It's hard to summarize, but, uh, you could find some lectures on YouTube and, uh, and other places. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Very nice to be here. So, uh, you were just telling me off air that, um, you are, are in the middle of, uh, a conference that's going on in Brazil. And yeah, that's right. Uh, this has been the uh, third international conference of research on anarchism that is uh, taking place uh, this week. Right now, as we speak, it's uh, today is uh, the 10th of November, so this week in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, and it's uh, all the program is there online, and uh, we can probably uh, add some links later uh, for the of uh, those who are joining the podcast to uh, to uh, look at that. Uh, the presentations are are mostly uh, in Spanish and in uh, uh, Portuguese, but there is really a great richness of research on anarchism going on in Latin America, um, and people have been doing that for years. And you know, I'm trying to kind of connect. Uh, the English-speaking world with with all of the great uh, work that's going on there. So people who do read uh, Spanish, Portuguese, really recommend it to take a look. Uh, as some of that is uh, my presentation from there was also uh, available on YouTube. It's all on the page of the Biblioteca Terra Livre, the yeah, free land uh, library, uh, and you can check out the links to that day. So I know one of the big things... Uh, well, it's bigger there than in the English-speaking world is a specifismo. Is that one of the topics that uh, has been at the conference much? I think the conference has been mostly a kind of a research-focused conference with a lot of both a kind of historical research into uh, anarchist uh, movements in uh, all of uh, South America and Latin America uh, during the kind of late 19th, early 20th, mid-20th century. Um, and the uh, kind of scope of uh, theoretical perspectives on anarchism that is available uh, in uh, Latin America and within, among anarchist groups as well is, is uh, I think, uh, uh, quite a wide perspective. So, yeah, there are uh, kind of specific anarchist organizations which are uh, more or less following uh, uh, within the kind of anarcho-communist and uh, sometimes platformist tradition. Uh, but, you know, there are, there are a lot of uh, anarchist groups that are influenced by, by other ideas and tendencies, whether, you know, from insurrectionism to primitivism to anarcho-queer feminism to indigenous uh, perspectives. And, you know, all of that richness is going on uh, in, in Latin America today, at least with the kind of, uh, you know, superficial impression that I get from looking at the titles of the papers uh, in that conference. So one of the big things that just happened there and uh, is happening elsewhere around the world, Israel, uh, United States is the elections. And, um, you know, we're seeing Lula get elected there, but uh, not looking very good in Israel. And right here, we're still in the middle of counting the votes. So I was wondering if you could share some thoughts on uh, the way you see anarchists interacting in these different places and current events. Yeah. I mean, you know, as an anarchist, the the kind of kind of nail biting at uh, at elections that that I also experience it for me that just underscores how powerless uh, most people are in the existing system to actually have an influence, right? Where so much hinges on the election of one leader that is less bad than the other, uh, and and when that but when that less bad difference can mean the difference between the, the survival of the Amazon or not. Who knows, right? But I mean, I think that just underscores how terribly concentrated power is in our society. Uh, you know, nothing should hinge so much on the selection of just a couple of hundreds of individuals, okay, in an in a, in a election to a, to a representative uh, house. We need to have a much more decentralized pattern of power in our society. Um, and of course, 
the fact that power is centralized through states um, is part and parcel of the whole kind of patterns of centralization of power in our society, which is which is also about capitalism and everything else. So, you know, we can't really imagine um, any real alternative to the system, I think, without a true decentralization of power, without community empowerment. That's what anarchism stands for. I don't judge anybody, you know, I mean, I think I, 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 I certainly wouldn't uh, spend carbon to travel to Israel, for example, where I'm a citizen in order to vote in the elections there. I, I wouldn't have done that. I mean, you know, the chance in a parliamentary system for your vote to make the difference of a seat to the party that you elect is smaller than your chance of getting run over by a truck on the way to the postal uh, box. You know, the, the, the influence is really infinitesimal. That's not to say that election campaigns are not opportunities for anarchists and for you know all kinds of social movements and causes to uh, to get people talking or to express express their their ideas. Um, but ultimately, elections and and especially the kind of current election cycle and the and the atmosphere that you know so much hinges on it is just a testament to to the gross, grotesque concentration of power in our societies. And it really shouldn't be like that. What are some inspiring projects you see anarchists working on towards uh, creating that um, decentralization of power? I mean, I think it depends where, where you're looking. Um, I have a sense that, you know, in many countries, certainly in the in the UK, uh, in Israel, um, there has been less anarchist activity. Um, in the UK, I mean, since squatting was illegalized and a lot of the social centers closed, then there's there's a lot less space, you know. Um, I mean, in Israel now, there is opened after years of a gap. There's a kind of a, a radical library, bookstore, talk space. There's finally a physical space, um, you know, in which in which um, in which there could be kind of activity from you know, for anarchists and and their allies. Um, so to me, like the, the very fact that the movement is still sort of surviving and that keeping keeping that those ideas alive and and kind of uh, having having them as as a kind of uh, you know point of reference for social struggles is is very significant. Given that we're you know we have experienced essentially 20, 20 plus years of intensive reaction. Um, you know, since since the alter global movement, with with a sort of reprieve around the Occupy and and Tahrir Square movement, but but those things were already to a degree captured. You know, um, and we see today that that basically, you know, there is, you know, I think I think the most inspiring thing that's happened lately is is actually the movement uh, of uh, uh, protest in Iran. Uh, although that's not been anarchists, right? That's been kind of a yeah, a women's liberation a movement and a and a and a movement for democracy and a movement for empowerment and movement for equality. Um, and it's hard to you know follow exactly the the protesters in their own words because you know you, you get it mediated by by Western media and everything like that. And I don't read Farsi, but you know I'm sure that there is you know the, the, that experience of the last few months just for, must have been. You know something extremely powerful, and I think it's extremely tragic the way that it's that it's you know now facing such heavy repression. I mean, I heard that the Iranian parliament the other day decided, you know, voted in a massive majority to to execute, um, a, like technically something like fourteen thousand prisoners who have been arrested during that time. You know, I haven't gone and and you know read details, and I don't know if they'll do it, but I think you know that's. You know that's definitely been one of the most powerful uh, struggles that that have been going on lately. Uh, a lot has been going on in Haiti. Um, there's been an uprising in Haiti. There's been an uprising in Sri Lanka. Um, you know, so so for me, like, it's less about what anarchists specifically are doing in in our own kind of you know niche uh, uh, scenes because because what we're doing there is is just producing, you know. Um, innovation and producing inspiration but where where we're you know where we see the real social struggles happening where we see the real inspiring things happening are in those mass movements especially uh, you know in in the global south have you been keeping up with what's going on in greece lately with uh, exarchia 
Not uh, moment by moment. I mean, you know, there are there are there is currently a, a lot of mobilization around a, a prisoner there who is uh, has been on hunger strike. Uh, so, you know, and and this is something else. There, you know, there are Palestinian prisoners on hunger strike. There is a kind of British Egyptian prisoner on hung, hunger strike now that's been kind of prominent around around the COP twenty seven summit. Uh, you know, those those are also very very powerful uh, powerful actions going on. Um, I think you know the I have I have you know I have friends and 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 uh, familiarity with with the Greek uh, movement. Uh, actually, Anarchy Alive is just about to be released uh, in Greek. Uh, it's been translated and uh, released by the uh, press uh, Panopticon, uh, which is based in Saloniki. They also do a magazine called Panopticon. And uh, yeah, I've been I've been to Greece previously when when the Book of Anarchists Against the Wall was translated and some some other essays of mine on Israel and Palestine. Uh, and yeah, there there are several you know not just in Athens, also in like I said in Thessaloniki, in uh, Yanina, in uh, Patras, uh, in other places there are there are you know uh, uh, quite uh, self uh, self consistent self sufficient uh, anarchist scenes. Um, you know, and 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 the other issue in Greece, of course, the the ongoing kind of uh, solidarity work that's going on in in the islands, in islands like Lesbos and others, uh, with the the migrants uh, and the refugees. Uh, you know that that are that are also one one of the migration routes is is also through uh, Greece, and and a lot of migrants end up in in Athens, and and of course there's racism against them, and that whole whole conflict with with in, in the context of that broader conflict with the far right. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not totally with my hands on the pulse about about Greece at the at the very moment, but there's certainly a lot uh, that's going on there to take interest in. Yeah. Uh, so one of the big uh, issues on the left here in the United States actually is uh, the situation in Palestine, the United States re- uh, relationship with Israel, and uh, you know, it's. Um, I became aware of your work. First, uh, through anarchists against the wall. Following that, and uh, that was already a long time ago. Mm-hmm. And um, for people who don't know what that is, I, I wanted uh, I wanted to uh, have you talk a little bit about that project and how it started and where it wound up going. And so this, I mean, sure, Anarchists Against the Wall was was a sort of a, a, a practical action initiative, which was about uh, Israelis and internationals joining uh, Palestinian popular committees who in the villages in the West Bank who had self-organized protests and resistance to the construction of the segregation barrier, uh, which cut through Palestinian land and uh, basically div- was part of the kind of uh, divide and conquer and ongoing colonial infrastructural entrenchment of Israel uh, in the West Bank. Um, the height of it was in the years kind of 2004, 2005. Um, it was not an ideologically anarchist group in the sense that it had no manifesto, no principles of action, no kind of vision for the region. It was you know people used to joke that it's essentially a travel agency for Israelis to get to West Bank demonstrations, like the like what internationals were doing with the International Solidarity Movement and other accompaniment projects uh, in the West Bank at the time that are still continuing. There are still uh, some demonstrations happening in villages uh, in the West Bank. It's it's become much smaller. Uh, the flashpoints have changed. The uh, sites of solidarity have changed, but there is still kind of active uh, solidarity of uh, Jewish Israelis coming over to the West Bank to accompany shepherds or to at least you know witness and uh, to a degree uh, you know uh, sometimes help resist um, home in, home demolitions, uh, you know settler attacks, um, and and everything else. Um, I think that the uh, main thing that uh, has changed, and that 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 I think that that anarchists against the wall and, and other groups on on the Israeli radical left have helped do, is to um, move, uh, you know, to move the left, uh, like to move the radical left um, in a strongly binational uh, direction. To understand that the only kind of credible. Uh, form of struggle against the uh, apartheid system and the inequality that we face is a Palestinian-Jewish partnership. 
um, and that uh, the the kind of uh, politics that that are that are implicit in that should be taken yeah. into account. Um, so you know, I think a lot of a lot of people f- made of anarchist against the world kind of more more than it deserved to be. Uh, it was kind of a, a very pragmatic action initiative, you know. Um, but that was kind of a already a, a kind of retreating battle in the situation in Israel and Palestine, which is which has only gone you know further and further uh, in in that trajectory of dispossession uh, ever since. Um, but of course, you know there there is there is still you know a, a small core of of radical activists, but again, it's it's extremely small. Um, and and it's it's uh, sort of uh, yeah in in a in a in very much in a kind of retreating retreating battle. Um, in terms of the current politics of Israel and Palestine and so on, I mean, I think that uh, you know some of the valuable perspectives in in English uh, uh, can be found in nine seven two magazine. It's an internet publication in English nine seven two mag. Um, you know, that's where you can find writing by both Palestinian and Jewish uh, writers, uh, you know, from from a critical perspective. And that's kind of one, one of the only uh, outlets currently for, yeah, for radical voices uh, in the region. So that's 972 MAG. Um, and there, there's, there's more, yeah, up to date there um, yeah. around the current struggles, around the analysis of the government and new elections. And yeah, that's a good, a good resource. The other thing to look at, uh, especially in the context of uh, the rise of the far right in Israel and its dominance, is the work of the journalist David Sheen. Um, I'd actually encourage you to invite him on on this show. Uh, David Sheen has uh, produced a few recent talks about uh, the uh, messianic extremist far right, um, its uh, entry into the center of Israeli politics, uh, the politics around these kind of third temple fanatics, uh, you know, what we call uh, sometimes uh, Daesh Judea, yeah, the, the Judean ISIS. Uh, they're pre- pretty much the kind of the, yeah, it could be thought of as the, as the Jewish equivalent of of, uh, of ISIS, basically, with, the, you know, the most extreme kind of people who want to build the third temple, want to blow up the mosques on Temple Mount and, and start an Armageddon war. You know, and and uh, the, these are the the right wing ex- religious extremists in Israel who are increasingly in, inside the mainstream, are in cahoots with the Christian fundamentalists in the United States, and and you know those those things are are very much kind of part of the politics there, entering into I think what is what is going to be a very uh, sensitive and and potentially explosive period uh, going into the next months. Yeah. So. Um... The other topic related to that is uh, BDS and uh, a lot of the left in the United States seems to be focused mostly in that direction, Uh, you know, boycott, divest and sanctions rather than uh, really taking this idea of Jewish Palestinian solidarity. Uh, more seriously, and I wanted. No, to... I don't. I don't. I don't think there's a contradiction there. So most most of us Israeli dissidents who are involved in Jewish Palestinian solidarity support BDS. Uh, you know, this is uh, this is an anti-apartheid campaign. The agenda is democracy for everybody, from the river to the sea. We should have democracy. Uh, they, I mean, in, in Hebrew, it's the other way around, and this is this is, I think, the aspect that 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 you're getting at, right? The the sense of uh, what is what is the place uh, of of Jews? What is the place of uh, of Jewish uh, senses of vulnerability of the genuine anti-Semitism that sometimes appears in some of the uh, some of these uh, uh, you know imageries and 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 uh, rhetoric? Um, I think that. Uh, the you know i think i think i think that the the bds campaign uh ought to be in in dialogue with those uh, forces on the american jewish left that that support it so i'm talking left of j street yeah uh, I'm talking, yeah, I'm, t- I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about right. about uh, people with an anti-colonial perspective, um, 
and and you know this the 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 agenda cannot can I don't I don't think that we can move to a stateless classless society in one leap from the current situation in Israel Palestine right I don't I don't think we can go there in one leap uh, so and 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 currently the 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 struggle is about the nature of the regime between the Jordan and the Mediterranean. It's about uh, the defense of lives, uh, defense of human rights, defense of political rights. This is not necessarily an anarchist lexicon, okay? Right. A struggle for, for democracy is, is not yet an anarchist struggle, but, you know, it, it, from, f- as, as, a, as an anarchist who is struggling in this particular, you know, I'm not, I'm not there either. But you can't, like, you know, th- th- this isn't a place where you're going to be purist. Right. This isn't the place where you're going to say, okay, the, I've written about this in, in, in more detail in, in some of my work, and people people can look at that if they want. But you know, I think I think there isn't a fundamental contradiction. We should um I think, you know, I think we should fight anti-Semitism where it appears, uh, which you know, in, in, in America it's appearing especially from the far right at the moment, right? Far right anti-Semitism, in my view, is is a disproportionately larger threat to Jews in the United States than, uh, you know, those um, occasional and and misinformed uh, kind of uh, surfacings of of anti-Semitic tropes in the past and solidarity movement. I don't deny they exist, but I don't think, I don't, you know, to me, to me, the threat to Jews today in the, in, in the Americas is, is primarily from far right anti-Semitism. Yeah, for Um, sure. And that's, and that's where, where the weight has to be. Um, and okay, I think I think it's it's up to uh, up to American Jews who who want to stand up for Palestinian rights to find the language or to find the the way in which to to make that you know. But I think in the long term, the the kind of um, nostalgic image of Israel that a lot of American Jews have, especially of the older generations, you know, those who, who went there in the '60s and now are in their '60s or '70s. Um, you know that that is not going to be a long-lasting image, and I think there is certainly a, a tectonic change in the relationship of uh, American uh, Jews to uh, the state of Israel. Um, and I think it's all, also going along with a, a quite a positive kind of reevaluation and, and, and increased interest in their Jewish identity. That's the actually... cultural, traditional, and even religious uh, aspects, uh, and I think that the and I think that this is uh, already a process that is rolling and that that will, will is is definitely going to change. But I think we're leading now. We are getting into another, you know, ten, fifteen, maybe years of of an anti-apartheid struggle. Okay, when the agenda is democracy, the agenda is a, a regime in which all subjects have equal human and political rights okay after that i mean th- th- this just shows how you know how tragic it's become that i can't even talk yeah. about you know uh, anti capitalism and, and and so on i mean of course there there have to be also social justice agendas and the whole thing has to come with environmental sustainability and women's empowerment and, and everything else okay mm-hmm. uh, but I'm I'm certainly I certainly want to encourage and strengthen the hands of those who are prepared to uh, change the disc, change the operating system in terms of of how they understand a, a Palestinian solidarity work, and who are uh, prepared to uh, speak in terms of an anti-apartheid struggle, in terms of a struggle for democracy on the whole territory, and that democracy can come as two states, as one state, as a confederation. There are all kinds of, of projects. Of course, I will always support the no-state solution. Um, but this is, you know, this is something that that should inspire our work in in the realistic terms of the present tense. So you, you briefly touched on this, uh, but something that comes up a lot for me living in Phoenix, Arizona, is decolonization, which, you know, here has a very concrete meaning because there's a lot of tribes whose land that we're living on. Uh, but as a Jew, this also comes up for me in a different way because of what does it mean to decolonize uh, my own experience? And I this uh, it becomes a tricky topic when we talk about Israel, because I know there's 
movements uh, from Israel that use this decolonization jargon to to mean something very nationalistic. And I was wondering if you're movements aware from of that. Israel. Say say that again. Israeli movements. Yeah. So. Um, uh, yes. So one is called Vision Magazine. Uh, there's a popular YouTuber named Rudy Rochman. And so, what's the? No, I mean, the, uh, I, I, I mean, it's ringing all my alarm bells. But what is this? So I guess the question is, the basic question is, what does decolonization mean for for America? Wait, they're they're trying to take decolonization and and twist it in a way that says what that the Palestinians are the colonizers and the Jews are the indigenous. Uh somewhat, yeah, something like that, or not so much that the Palestinians are colonizers. Then but what? That, but Jewish that, uh, indigeneity in Palestine and so on. Yeah, as if. Yeah. Okay. First of all, it's very clear that this is a bad faith right wing argument that that is that is ultimately intended to keep conditions as they are and to and to undermine the view of the situation in uh, Israel and Palestine as a settler colonial regime. Okay. It has about the same level of credulity as a. Uh, uh, a Syrian or someone saying that I can't be anti-Semitic because I'm Semitic, right? That that's about the level of 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 the of the argument. Now, point I think is that for, there are two points. One, decolonization is about regime change. It's not about population change. Right. Decolonizing the Americas doesn't mean that all the whites go back to England and Italy and Ireland, right? No, I mean uh, maybe there are some indigenous activists who are suggesting that, but I, I haven't seen it. Uh, it means changing the arrangements of power around the land, as well as all of the culture, right? It's the massive cultural change, regime change. I would argue it means change to to the absence of a, a regime, in the archaic sense of the word. Um, and so I think that that it's important to to use this insight in order to uh, engage with the immediate sort of sense of threat that people might feel against the term. okay? so so this is why this is white fragility and how to deal with it, yes. Yeah. But you know, people, people, people hear colonization. They might hear, you know, go back to Europe or, or like, you know. Uh, now, in the case of Palestine, I'm like, I don't want to be in denial about this. Yeah, that that many Palestinians, if you ask them in the street in a casual way, like, what's going to happen after the Palestinians get their liberation? They'd say the Jews will have to leave, and I don't blame them for feeling like that in the current situation either, right? Sure, but. But I think, and to say nothing, that, that there is also Israelis whose fantasies are about continuing the ethnic cleansing of, of okay. So we need to, diso first of all, we need to dissociate decolonization from reverse ethnic cleansing. Okay. To clarify that it's about regime change, not population change, about cultural change, about change of relationships to the land and around the land, uh, and an equalization of power relations and a dismantlement of, of, of colonial and, and hierarchical institutions. Secondly, when it comes to indigeneity, I think we, I think we need to acknowledge that indigeneity is something that is co-constructed with colonialism. Okay? Indigeneity is not about always having lived somewhere or having one's ancestral home somewhere. It's about having one's invaded ancestral home. Now, whether this is a, something that, that uh, you know, I, I, I don't, I, it doesn't make sense to me to kind of twist that retroactively 2,000 years back in order to, to sort of make, make some kind of indigenous argument that way. But, but even if you do, okay, all that means is that, you know, there is a space for a Jewish 
cultural affiliation, connection, and even habitation in uh, the land between the Jordan and the Mediterranean. But that doesn't say anything about the form of regime, if any, that's supposed to exist there. It doesn't say anything about the distribution of power in the society of the people who live there. Right. So, you know, the, 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 so ultimately the use of, 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 of folk indigenous argumentation by, by Zionists, um, is, is a bad faith, B, uh, sort of again, taking that debate towards who owns the land, who has a legitimate claim, right, into these grand historic narratives, instead of asking what is the form of the regime in the land? What are the human beings currently alive? What is the distribution of power among them? Okay. How are the Palestinians living? What rights are the Palestinians being denied? This is what it's about. It's about the, 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 the material and social and political conditions under which you, current human beings live. It's not about constructing sort of grand justificatory uh, narratives. But to me, the, like, to me, what this, this kind of whole thing is, is basically sophisticated trolling. You know, it's the, you know, it's the kind of thing that, you know, the, the, the kind of Zionist uh, uh, appropriation of, of indigenous claims. It's trolling. It's, it's the same kind of, of, you know, things that like, there's a bunch of, of uh, very unsavory Marxists in the UK. They go under various names: the Institute of Ideas, Living Marxism, other things like that. Like you know, they'll they'll take stances like you know, they'll be anti-environmental because they say it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a middle class agenda. They'll yeah. support animal experimentation. Um, you know, they'll say that it's okay for parents to use corporal punishment. And if you don't, if you say that you shouldn't, then you're oppressing working class culture. Yeah. You know, it's it's that kind of, of trolling, you know, of trolling of the left that, you know, it's it's not something that, that people should get into knots about because it's not, it, ultimately, it's not a good faith argument. It's, it's coming in bad faith. Excellent. So let, let's switch gears a little bit. Okay. Uh, we don't want, you know, we could spend a long time talking about that, but uh, there's so much more to talk about. Um, a lot of what I've seen on YouTube that you, that of uh, yours that's on there is the discussion of technology. Mm -hmm. And one of the other big topics that comes up for me when I'm talking to Marxists or non-anarchists here is they want to understand what the different ideas about technology are for anarchists. And I know you're familiar with them. I'm familiar with them, but you have a take that seems a little bit closer to mine because I look at the question from like eco phenomenology. Uh, I don't really read a lot of Zerzan or uh, Bookchin. Um, and what I saw in your, uh, you had a like a 15 minute conversation on YouTube where you were talking about. Um, the social relationship that's necessarily tied into any kind of technological development. And I wanted to know if you're still working on these ideas, if you could elaborate on them a little bit more. I haven't and, written a lot about it uh, uh, lately, but uh, first of all, all of my writings can pretty much be read, at least, if not downloaded from uh, academia.edu. Uh, my article on anarchism and the politics of technology, I think, is also available on the Anarchist Library, uh, if people want to get into, into that at full. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think the point is to bring into uh, anarchist discourses kind of a um, power-based assessment of technologies uh, and whether technological platforms uh, encourage uh, more or less concentration of power, uh, more or less user empowerment, and so on, and, and technological systems need to be assessed, uh, you know, on on the basis of that. Now, it's no question that most of the technological systems we live with are part of a society that is organized around hierarchy, profit, command, competition, and so on. And a society shapes the the technologies, right? The, the social ends are are sort of hardwired into the the technological means that that are uh, used to promote them. Um, I think uh, you know there is a lot to be said both for questioning uh, any sort of uh, modernist techno optimism uh, or notion of 
uh, technological progress as something that is in and of itself valuable without any social considerations. Um, just as I think there is a value in uh, reassessing and engaging with um, the lifeways of early humanity and uh, pre, pre-colonial uh, cultures, uh, in order to denaturalize uh, current social uh, structures and 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 sort of render them not no longer obvious and no longer natural. Um, and you know, I think that it's important for all of us to uh, more than kind of uh, yeah achieve reach some kind of uh, you know consistent. Uh, anarchist position on technology to actually practice a lot of kind of reconstructive and rehabilitative uh, uh, practices, uh, whether that's just making compost or growing what, what vegetables you can or water harvesting and to do it in a community context, right? I think that, that one of the main things that, you know, it, this is the debate about technology is, is now going, has to be completely reshaped. It's not just a principal debate. It's a debate that's happening in the context of, uh, industrial and uh, biospheric collapse. Okay, and 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 I think that you know if if you look at things like Rhiannon Firth's recent book Disaster Anarchy, which is about kind of mutual aid uh, uh, movements, uh, both in uh, you know uh, uh, after following hurricanes and following other other things, and 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 around the COVID pandemic and so on, <clears throat> the importance of um, of collectivity, of community, uh, side by side with kind of practical applications, uh, increased self-reliance, local reliance, human level convivial technologies. I think all, all of these are themes that, that that are coming to the fore at the moment. Uh, but again, you know, I've 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 not kind of had a, a deep think about these things recently. But but I'd really recommend for those who are especially interested in kind of the anarchist uh, uh, intersection with with the current uh, kind of social ecological questions to to look at the work of Rhiannon Firth. Uh, she also also has a very good article with Andy Robinson on um, positions towards technology, humanism, uh, and and structuralism, uh, and that's also a, a free to read. Um, that's by Rhiannon Firth and Andy Robinson. Um, you can also find the link to that link. I'll definitely look for that and get those links in the show description as well. Um, you, you mentioned you were doing some work on Freddie Perlman. He's got uh, a pretty wide range of topics. He discusses technology, one being one of them. What, um, what is some of the, what what exactly are you doing in this work? Sure. So I mean, this is I've I've completed this. This is a paper that's about to be published in Anarchist Studies, in which I pr- presented uh, uh, to the conference in Brazil. Uh, so I'm basically dealing with Freddie's work that precedes his turn to ecofeminism and uh, critiques of domestication, looking mainly at his work uh, in the late '60s and early '70s. And my main argument is that. Uh, Perlman is much more important than just about the primitivism. A lot of people are familiar with Perlman's work from Against His Story, Against Leviathan, and so on. But I would say that uh, Perlman is extremely significant for his uh, for championing uh, what John Moore would later call an anarchist maximalism, uh, an approach that combines a, a critique of domination as a, as a totality, as multiple intersecting regimes of domination, with a practice focused on direct action and the creation of uh, alternatives. And what Perlman does is take the uh, a sort of quite a heterodox Marxian critique of alienation and the fetishism of commodities, and he kind of what, what, what some people call value form theory, uh, you know, uh, economists like Isaac Ilyich Rubin, who was executed by Stalin and, and other people that, that basically look at the way in which relations between people are mediated by things. And Perlman concludes that the way out of alienation is not a mental break, but a practical break. And that when, for example, the students in Paris, which was a struggle that he experienced, uh, transformed the university into a place of discussion, solidarity, and, and changed the institutional structure of how they were working, they were practicing a kind of process of 
of social and political disalienation. This is what anarchists talk about when they talk about concrete utopia or prefigurative politics and so on. But Perlman also increasingly looks at the state, looks at uh, patriarchy, uh, looks at uh, religion and inter intellectual production as um, sort of systems of domination that are on par with uh, capitalism and, and the alienation of productive powers. Uh, so he, he sort of takes, he, he moves beyond um, the uh, sort of Marxian um, pivotal point of economic relations. Uh, and he actually sounds much more like Malatesta and Kropotkin when he talks about kind of uh, this oligarchy of, of elites, none of which is ultimately, you know, uh, uh, can be boiled down to one form of power. Um, and and you know it was it was an, and I think I think that you know Perlman's attitude to to anarchism, uh, which is intersectional, which is uh, about uh, which is practice focused, which is diverse, which is uh, about uh, experiment uh, and creativity, um, and which believes in the power of uh, mass uprisings to uh, create kind of new social forms that they need to be defended. Um, and 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 the refusal of mediation and representation, you know, I think that this is something that has had an immense influence on American, especially, and then on on global anarchism through the 80s and, and into the 90s. And and this is not just about primitivism. This is about the entire sort of post left discourse. This is about the the space created for insurrectional perspectives. This is about um, the uh, multiple. Um, Kind of intersectionalities that that have been uh, uh, explored uh, by anarchist resistances. Um, so you know everything that's that's sort of outside of the very traditionalist, anarcho-communist, or syndicalist uh, uh, approaches. Uh, you know which which exist and which and which are also part of part of modern anarchism. But I think I think Perlman is easily alongside uh, Noam Chomsky and Murray Bookchin, the most important uh, American anarchist writer of his generation, and a much more consistent and deeper anarchist than his two peers. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's, I, it, if anything, I just want to encourage people to get into Perlman's earlier writings as well, and to especially the kind of uh, Worker Student Action Committee's Paris 68, um, his book, The Incoherence of the Intellectual, which is a bit more uh, kind of cerebral and scholarly, and especially the very amazing, ironic, kind of parodic book, um, The Manual for Revolutionary Leaders, which uh, twists a, a very astute critique of power, um, an anarchist critique, I would argue, uh, in order to lampoon authoritarian tendencies in, in the new left of, of the time. And the other, the last thing to say about Perlman is that he is an amazing illustrator, uh, collage creator, uh, you know, printer, and and the visual and graphic aspect of his work is uh, exceptional, um, you know. And and he was doing all of this before there was Xerox, before there was computer, right? It was like with with analog print overlays. Um, so as much as, you know, this can encourage people to get into Perlman's work and, and learn more about him, then uh, that, that was the purpose of that primarily. Because there's just almost no second secondary sources on Perlman. There's very little uh, work that's been done on him. Uh, he has this kind of, you know, he's this, he's this anarchist writer who many people have, have read a little bit or many have heard of, but, you know, he's he's like this this whole kind of, treasure chest full of full of full of content for analysis and i was just trying to break some ground there yeah and that yeah the, the manual for revolutionary uh uh leaders is really funny uh too i um uh i know lbc did a print of it i think it's still around for uh uh, print copy if anybody yeah, he wanted. also has an amazing novel called letters of insurgents which i don't oh, i don't yeah. have space to analyze here and it's it's yeah i mean he, he was such a creative force he was he was really i mean i think proman is is 
as important as as Emma Goldman, as Kropotkin. I mean, he's, he's I think ultimately is going to be more important than Bookchin, definitely more than Chomsky, uh, in terms of developing anarchist thought and taking it into new directions. So, um, you know, lastly, you know, the book that uh, I know a lot of people are familiar with that you wrote is Anarchy Alive. And uh, I have a browser window open with the uh, anarchyalive.com website on it with that's that's really on. defunct i wouldn't uh, i wouldn't look at that anymore that's that's ancient okay <laughs> all my work can be read uh if you go to academia.edu uh, you can find my profile um i used to have a wikipedia article up but somehow it was deleted so if you want to recreate it there's still the german version you can translate but i won't do it myself um and yeah, I mean, some of my materials on the Anarchist Library, Anarchy Alive, the book is uh, available, I think, in its entirety on the Anarchist Library and also uh, on Libcom in the PDF version. Um, so yeah, you can look at that. I mean, that's that's already kind of more than 10 years old, but but has some kind of debates in, in contemporary issues in anarchist theory. Um, and hopefully a, a new book of uh, that kind of uh, incorporates and 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 develops uh, some of my more recent work in the last decade uh, is going to be coming out uh, not too long into the future. Um, and the prospective title for that is Anarchist Tensions. Excellent. All right. Well, I really appreciate having you come on the show. There's a lot of uh, really important topics we were able to talk about. Is there anything else you're working on or anything that you want to promote um, before we end the episode? Well, uh, not for the moment, but, you know, there's a lot more to talk about. And I'll be glad to uh, visit the podcast and the program again to talk about other topics uh, and even go deep into some of them. All right. Thank you very much, Yuri. I'm thank you very it. much. Thanks for Stop listening, everybody. You.